here. It's 2020. I assume that I am streaming. Uh, Chuck is off and about today, but Tim is here. How's it going, Epi? I've got a new microphone. They call it mic, whatever they call it. And I got some lighting going on up here. So hopefully things are a little bit clearer. How's it going, Retro Gamer? Uh, I, I, this arrangement's not going to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This, I, I, it's a cacophony of crap right now behind the behind the camera. I, I'll have to fix this later, but <laughs> it'll work. It'll work for today's uh, chat without a doubt. Yeah, oh, she funny. I gotta get some makeup on the dome of my head, I guess. Cause it's, <laughs> it's all shiny. <laughs> my son swears my hair is receding, but uh, I've always just had a giant dome of a head. Alright, how's it going, Raven Shadows? I did not, actually. Uh, I've got one queued up, but uh, I, have, I, <laughs> I haven't watched any of them. I did end up on a whim watching The Hunt um, night before last, last night or something. And primarily because I was bored and I noticed that uh, one of the main characters comes from Arkansas. <laughs> so I thought, ah, I gotta watch that. That's uh, <laughs> tipping the hat to the home stake. Back to Boston's Treasures. Good dog, good job, Geek Preacher. Much appreciated. Very much appreciated. Uh, this is going to be our trilogy of box sets for 5th edition. Uh, that, uh, you know, we've got Archives Volume 1 and Archives Volume 2, and we'll do Archives Volume 3, uh, along with, of course, the m and of A will be in there, and bring the uh, the home kick and caboodle to 5th uh, edition, which will be kind of nice. Uh, we are absent Chuck today. He's got some personal attention, personal matters he's got to attend to, but uh, Tim is here to uh, play ball, I suppose. Uh, there we go. There is the Kickstarter. If you have not backed it, uh, at least uh, give it a share. We very much appreciate uh, any and all attention you can throw its way. <laughs> uh, I don't think it's required, Geek Preacher, but it is very, very much appreciated. <laughs> Very, very much appreciate it, uh, and we still have to uh, uh, we, we still have to to do a show together where we talk about uh, playing deities uh, at the table. I think that would be very, very cool, especially now that. So I got the last of. Uh, we had to re do the reprinting. I got a lot of that done, and Egyptium is all approved. The blue lines are all approved. They don't call them blue lines anymore. They call them approved. But everything's approved, and uh, Moon Dog, how's it going? Uh, and uh, it, that's done, and Kaltarum should be up today. Uh, I mean, the proofs should be back to me today now, and then uh, uh, I'll go through and approve those. I'm hoping by Friday those two books are full board printing, and I have nothing more to do with them other than ship them when I get here. Um, oh, fire away, fire away, Commander Pete. I have one more. I wasn't saying that. That was Moon Dog <laughs> in the chat. This light's kind of hot. I might, I might need to turn the fan on. It's cooking up in here pretty good. Um, let's see. We've been discussing bandages on Discord. The only place that they've mentioned is in the equipment of those bandages to use for one to a piece and then inside the first aid cancer that says it doesn't need it. It seems everyone has a different approach of how bandages should work, but it's not covered in gel. How do you handle them? Actually, I think... Hold on. It is... Uh, I use bandages a lot. Um... Because we're always scrabbling for healing in my table. We, right now they've got absolutely zero healing and they're all mangled and chopped to pieces. And I'm supposed to meet the demon in the next session, so it's going to go horribly. It's going to go horribly. Hold on, let me let me get somewhere in Bandages Earth, page 66, the Adventurer's Backpack. Um, yeah, so what we did here, and this is a lot of this comes straight from, from the table that I run. We've got applying bandages, uh, and this allows you to the rules kind of cover what um, how much how many wounds the bandages can cover, and how much hit point they actually heal. And the idea is that these bandages aren't just you know modern day a, a rat that goes around a wound or a suture or what have you. It's actually medicated with herbs and, and ointments and whatnot, so that when it when you wrap it, you can actually heal someone for one to two points of damage. That's the any dressing and bandage applied to the wound within four rounds of the wound occurring heals the patient for one to two points of damage. Uh, so that's kind of how 
your standard bandages. So you can get, you know, if you, if you use a lot of bandages and, and obviously the character is multiple, has multiple wounds, you can get uh, quite a few eight hit points back, potentially. Um, and we've got reusing bandages and then there's the medical kit that you can get in there with the medical kit. So when I researched this part of the adventure pack, it's actually quite an eye opener for me. Uh, you know, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm fairly versed in history, but not, uh, certainly not medical history and certainly not other, you know, too much of the minutia of the way people lived in the ancient times. Um, but the Romans had quite, quite the surgical kit that their doctors used. They could actually scrape the eyeballs with uh, a small tool and whatnot. So I took that and, and ran with the medical kit concept on that. So if you get to the wound quick enough and you use the medical kit, you heal another good point. So with your bandages and your medical kit, you're doing pretty good. And then we threw in herbs and that you can actually kind of apply as well and heal yet another one. And then I threw in there soap. Um, I don't think it's... Okay, so the soap didn't actually give you a healing, any healing, but it did give you a bonus on save against any natural disease. Um, so that essentially what I'll do, because I do a lot of bleeding at my table. Uh, they take horrific wounds from slashing uh, or cutting weapons, claws or bites, and um, I'll have the bleed. So next two or three rounds, I'll frequently say you take another part of damage, take another part of damage. Bandages will stop that immediately, uh, and I, and and. After right after researching and looking at this, and after writing up this, so many problems with healing because of the way my table does the player, um, which is, means they don't they don't feel very much to get other spells and don't help anybody. Uh, that uh, you know we had to just any kind of salve we could put on this wound was was done so. So the bandages were were you know boosted quite a bit. And then the discourse that we had everywhere of using it that use within four rounds of a wound. <laughs> yeah. Well that's kind of the trick, right? I mean, if you are wounded and you continue to bleed out, uh it should coagulate and stop bleeding after a few uh, a minute, I really don't know <laughs> the coagulation speed of blood. But I it's relatively quick. I mean all everyone who dies to got wounded. Uh, that's the whole the whole purpose of it. But um uh, yeah, so you get to them, you get to them pretty quick, and then patch them up. Of course, what that means is, is that, and this is what I like about the bandages concept. If you're using this as a healing thing, uh, I love the concept of characters grievously wounded, takes 30 points of damage, uh, on the on the verge of death, falls out of the combat to get bandaged up, and then goes back in a few minutes later, uh, and it kind of. I remember when my uh, my father was in the military, and we were talking tactics one day. Uh, this is a long, long time ago, and he said, "You frequently." He didn't say frequently. That's not. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth. He was a very direct individual, but he said one of your objectives is to wound the enemies, uh, even as much as kill them, because for every wounded uh, soldier, every wounded person that you knock down, you've pretty much knocked out two or three people as they drag that individual back and out of the combat. So wounding someone, and he didn't say that was an objective, but he said that if you wound someone, it can have the same amount of an impact as killing someone badly, and even potentially exponentially greater. So I've always loved the concept, the idea that, you know, as the chaos of combat is swirling around your table and characters are jumping in and out and slashing and cutting and there's claws and bites and all this business, uh, that somebody, somebody's forced to grab someone and pull them out, bandage them up before they can go back in. It just kind of creates a different, I don't know, a whole, it just adds to the chaos that I love to have in combat, uh, which is really, really cool. Looks like we are being raided by 20 Fed TV. Thanks for the raid, guys. That is very awesome. Uh, very, very cool. Uh, I don't think we'll be reciprocating any raids today because Tim and Tim and I do not have that technical capability. But <laughs> we sure appreciate you guys heading over uh, and plundering the troll then. And this also slipped into the other topic that was discussed, and that was how to let players heal a bit faster with home rule and the raw of one hit point day can result in a lot of downtime, but using bandages effectively can result in a less need for healing, particularly at low. Yeah, so the, the bandages and the medical kit and the herbs can all kind of uh, accelerate that um, because it is, I mean, it's if you go by the strict rules, it's, it's one hit point a day, right, for seven days, and then you get one hit point plus your con bonus. So if you don't have a con bonus, you're not healing very much, so it's just the one, but even then, two or three. You know, three, four maximally. And that can be very slow for a fifth or sixth or ninth level character. 
so so natural healing is a good thing. I've kind of thrown in things like uh, if they eat well, if they'll take you know the time to rent a room and eat and sleep and all this stuff. Throw a few extra hit points. I do just about anything I can to get hit points back on them because we do play day by day. Uh, and seven, and it's not anymore if they're wounded and they don't have healing. It can be three weeks, two weeks that they're down uh, and kind of knocked out. So, but uh, definitely, healing's tricky. If your cleric, that's why we let the illusionist heal, obviously. And if your cleric can't, then uh, it's an issue. It's an issue. I think um, it's a little bit. Here I go again. Why am I yawning? Um, the skald. So we also, yeah, and we've run into this uh, using the skald at the table. The skald can also heal. So we've thrown healing out there as much as we humanly can, uh, or game, game design we really can, uh, just in order to get healing at the table in, in a different way. So the cleric, everything's not on the house of the cleric to be a medic. I just don't like the concept. If you if you like the concept of the cleric, if you like the concept of the cleric of as a medic, that's fantastic. But you should have the option that he's not the medic. That the cleric actually has some other role to play other than just, you know, touching and healing. And I know that I think fourth edition got really bad about it, but I know that other versions of the game will really carry that to the to the extreme and, and I don't like it. So yeah, you're right, you're dead on. Um I- anything that can kinda beef up and I would actually probably extrapolate a little bit it actually says that um, if you're resting and, and fresh bandages every day, you heal even more. Uh, and that will accelerate things quite a bit. Yeah, so if any dressing bandage applied to the wound, it heals the wound when you want to reflect the healing elixir. Who knows if the bandage allowed? Whoever is applying the bandage is allowed a primary after you check. Oh, so you can heal up to three. There you go. So we didn't we didn't carry it on. We probably should have carried that on so that if you're if you use these medicated bandages, you know, on on someone who's resting, it should heal them a little bit more. I think that I would actually carry that through. Uh, so if that kills a four round thing trying to get to the wound, um, I don't know. It's very interesting. Uh, he- healing is it, it's a it's a crazy challenge. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is Ask Me Anything. Uh, this is Tuesday, June 23rd, and I am Steve Chenault of Trollord Games, uh, CEO, General Manager, whatever you, want, whatever you want to call me. I started using the title CEO because it was, it was, this was my wife's idea. She also has a company, and uh, we were doing a whole bunch of tax documents one day, hers for hers and me for mine, and, and I watched her write CEO, and I said, well, when did you become the CEO? And she said, well, it's... It's easier to write CEO than it is general manager. <laughs> so I said, oh, I'm the CEO now. <laughs> so I just changed my title to CEO to, so that the government will slow me down just a little bit less <laughs> with all its infernal <laughs> infernal paperwork. Put a delayed blast fireball in a bundle of food and leave it out in the bandage. <laughs> yeah, Pete, I think you're, <laughs> you're more for destroying characters as opposed to trying to keep them alive. Somehow or the other. You do plan a mean, a mean and all, isn't it? So, if you have any questions, please give us a shout. Let me know. And I'll do my best to answer it, whether it's about troll lord business or industry business or whatever else is going on out there. Uh, I, I will do what I can. Uh, but thank you all for joining me today. Uh, we'll be here for till about five, and then we'll wander off. Uh, that's my why you need the ball. Hey, don't you have a bus to be laying out? Actually, you don't. You don't have a book to be laying out. <laughs> I, I, I just opened Keltar a little while ago, uh, so we'll be wrapping that up. Well, the CNC version of the MTA be updated after the Kickstarter of the 5 the MTA is done. Yeah, I'm not sure when, but it definitely will. Uh, once this thing goes full color and we get, uh, you know, all of that done, and I may roll it together simultaneously uh, when we send this. We get uh, the printers are always free with discounts if we send them more than one book at a time. So um, uh, it's it's very possible. I still think I still think we've got a few hundred or five hundred left in the MTA. I can't I can't remember. But I, I really what's what's actually fixing to go out of print is the Castles and Crusades. Oh, I don't have one in the drawer. Castles and Crusades, the uh, player's guide to air. That I've only got literally about ten left I think or twelve. 
uh, and then she's out of print. So that's going to be – we're running out of – all of these books we're, we're running out of. Uh, but uh, I'm going to have to move – I'm going to take a lot of stuff from the fifth edition Player's Guide to Aired because it's got a better uh, a better uh, player's, player's introduction to the world of Aired and it's been TNC version does. So I want to jam that in there. And then we've got a little bit else to put in there. So uh, probably that one. I'm not sure – I'm not sure when. I guess it's, the schedule is complete chaos right now with Egyptium still hanging on and Keltarm still hanging on and uh, Memorial Tomb. We've got to get that thing hammered out. And there's another big one. We did finish Amazing Adventures. It's all shipped and gone. Oh, Gaxmar. We've got to get Gaxmar. Now, I will say this that uh, just to, as a heads up uh, for everybody out there who's both a fan of 5th edition and a fan of Castle of Crusades, this. This Kickstarter we're running now will end in 20, 21 days, and it's the last 5e Kickstarter we have on the schedule. Um, it's, we're going to shift full board in the Castles and Crusades, going into Alstrad, Planescape, uh, and a couple other projects that uh, we've mentioned before. But uh, we're going we're gonna to shift off of 5th edition uh, and get uh, right back into uh, what we need to be doing, which is ever more Castles and Crusades. Really want to get this plane state the God involved. I really want to get this Planescape stuff out and done. Um, it's, it's just cool stuff. So lots of TNC in the next 12 months. Uh, we hope. Talk to David about the NPC All My Act today. So that should be wrapping up by summer's end. Uh, just all kinds of uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, thank you for the sub, uh, DM Samuel. Very much appreciated. I love that as you said it's the last five that you looked at the board as uh, you know, <laughs> well. There's a lot of stuff over there, <laughs> and, I was, and I was looking, and I've got a five e, I got a note up there, but uh, we're not going to, we're not going to move on that. <laughs> There's so many titles. It's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit frustrating. There's so many things that I want to do that I want to be working on right now, and I can't because we've got to wrap up uh, a lot of these projects. And every time we start wrapping up one, something goes out of print, which means, of course, we've got to go back in and, you know tweak it and fix it and whatever, and it's just a mess, and that just pushes stuff that I want to do further down the line. I think um, somebody had mentioned there was a problem with uh, the character classes books. Well, I, I had an extra, it, we were printing them in the shop. We had run out in the mail room, so I, I needed the shop to print deep, and I didn't want to print deep until I fixed the, the problem that was in the character classes book, and I thought, I'm just going to do this quick notation, get it back to press. Well, once I got into it, there was a font issue. Uh, Peter, Peter Bradley is much, much better at layout than me, and he can kind of work around these things. I can't really work around them, so I had to fix the font issue. And then there was um, a missing the Forsworn was not in there. And then I got all that laid out. I got all the TLC put together. And then I realized that the thing that I originally had gone in there to put in there. <laughs> I didn't put in there. So I went in and I put that in there and that knocked a column off onto another page and I had to lay the whole bloody thing out. Um, so it was, I think I was up till 2 in the morning. I started, I started at like 9 and I was up till about 2 in the morning just trying to fix that, that thing. I got it done, but uh, it, it's everything that, everything that we <laughs> we do, it all is just, you know, it takes a little bit of tender love and care. I see Tim just to let Steve know my nose lagging so bad. It's fun for you to try and follow. Yeah, so I'm going to get back to work. You're on your, you're on your, there you go. <laughs> All right, well, hopefully nothing goes awry with this bloody sunlight. I'm going to have to figure this out. I think what I'm going to have to do is get a new camera so that I can move this arrangement somewhere. <laughs> do something with it. Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, Commander Pete, I hope, man. We got we got a lot of it coming. Not just lots of it. And I want to get more short adventures out there, more stuff crossovers with uh, Fat Dragon Games. I love this stuff. And so we've got all kinds of stuff. It's just floating all over. When you lay out enough things, enough times, lazy people like me. <laughs> yeah, what it was, Peter, you had done, you had imported the classes from the Adventures backpack, uh, and I assume that you kept their, the label of their... Paragraph header, but the player's handbook and the, the adventures backpack had different paragraph headers. And every time I did the the TOC to kind of update it, it would all be jumbled and messed up. So I eventually had to go through and fix everything, and then it all went brown <laughs> to the 
whatever tech, whatever color that you use on the color book, uh, it carried over from the Avengers backpack. <laughs> the text kept going brown, and I and I would change it to black, and then it would go back to brown, and I'd change it to black, and it go back to brown. Uh, and I didn't. It took me I don't know way too long to figure out that it was set in the paragraph style. So I had to go into the paragraph style and fix that. Somewhere around 12.30, I about uploaded it to the Dropbox and was going to Skype you and said, Peter, can you please fix this uh, before the morning? Because I know it would take you like five minutes to fix it. <laughs> it takes me over an hour or so. Oh, yeah, these software conversions. Yeah, I don't know if you guys out there are using any of this Adobe stuff. It's fantastic software. It is really, really good software. But, man, every time they do an update, they really send you all the notifications. They really want you to update something fierce. So you update it. Even when you tell it to keep your arrangement, whatever stuff, it goes back to whatever, you know, baseline that they're using and you got to fix it. It's just, it's just a mess. It just eats up a lot of time. Um, <laughs> if it can be stout, uh, we do the whole subscription deal. Uh, it's, it could, we, we use, you know, InDesign, Photoshop, uh, Acrobat, and we have in the past used their filmmaking and other stuff. So for us, the, we just go all in it. But it's stout. You're not kidding. Okay, now I'm curious. What do you use for laying out Adobe or something else? We use Adobe InDesign. Uh, Peter and I use that. I think um, I think Jason Bay, even for his stuff, has gotten over. But pretty much the way it goes is we've got templates for Victorious Amazing Adventures, both versions CMC and 5E. And I'll throw the raw text to Peter, and Peter does all the heavy lifting. He lays everything out, sets the styles and sets the, you know, the paragraphs are indented and it's out size places of the art, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll go back, and then he's done and passes it on to me, and then I'll go back and just kind of look for stuff uh, that he might have missed and kind of move this, move that, you know, whatever. And add a piece of text to like, just a second set of eyes. So I do the, I do the light lifting after Peter, Peter does the heavy lifting. Um, but he, <laughs> like he mentioned earlier, he uses shortcuts to break when I get around. And he'll explain these shortcuts to me, but I can't ever remember when I'm at 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm trying to do this stuff. Affinity, I've, I've heard of that, but I'm not sure I'm not, I'm not sure we're going to switch. I am very, very happy with InDesign, very happy with Photoshop, and I really like the Acrobat. I mean, it's, I can get into these PDFs and really muck around, uh, and it's nice. It's very, very nice. I also tweak map assets and stuff with Affinity Photo or Affinity Designer. So you're using Affinity. Interesting. I mean, we may have to check it out. I mean, I, I started with PageMaker back in 2000. Uh, and so I've been, with, I've been with Adobe for a while now. <laughs> Switching over might be kind of tough. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm very happy with Photoshop. I, and I like it all integrated. But we'll see. You never know. I mean, uh, there's software all over the place. I'm actually, what is that... Uh, I, I have been using, I use Netscape, and then I went into Firefox years ago, and I've been using Firefox. <laughs> yeah, PageMaker, yeah, absolutely. I love PageMaker. But, you know, I struggled with that program for the longest time trying to figure out how to move, get text to, to auto, auto generate to the next column. I remember that. It took me days to figure that out. You just hold the mouse down and drop it. <laughs> it's really funny. I like PageMaker. PageMaker embedded the art so you could get the art easily, whereas Photoshop, it doesn't. It keeps it in a, in a, a links folder, which is fine, but yeah, <laughs> exactly. I love Netscape, and I switched to Firefox. So Firefox has got all my crap in it, you know, all the bookmarks, company, my playlist, and whatever the crap. But I'm thinking of switching. Davis has been on me a little bit about going to, is it DuckDuckGo? Uh, that's a, it's some kind of some kind of something or the other that's supposed to be a little bit more, you know, less less sharing of, of our data, which always bothers me. I know, I know that we use these platforms that someone else owns and they have the right to do whatever <laughs> our crap that they do, but it just bugs me. Really. So I'm to go with that. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm thinking of, of switching my whole search engine thing from Fire Step. No. Yeah. Firefox. Firefox to DuckDuckGo, but it's, you know, it's a huge, all the bookmarks, everything, it's a gigantic, it's a gigantic ordeal, and I'm just not inclined to give myself a gigantic ordeal when I've already got about 47 of those to deal with, uh, as it is, uh, but uh, we'll see. 
All right. I'm goofy things up here. And the breathing in. Hmm. I don't think I remember that. I'll, I'll, I'll have to. I'll have to look at what you're talking about. I love Netscape, um, but I don't really remember an in in the world is going on. I don't know what I did. Yeah, nothing's coming up with the all the geeks or browser. That sounds familiar. So, all right, Miranda, if you're going to have to explain the breathing in, nothing, <laughs> nothing is coming up. Uh, <laughs> was it something pulsating or something? Man, it's been so long since I've used that game. And I was just sad when it, when it ended. I remember not being very happy. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not really that paranoid to me, but I want to be. I keep telling myself, man, this has got to be real. I don't know if you can see it. I guess not, but... I have over here on my wall. I want, <laughs> I want to believe, I want this to all be happening. But you know, I, I was in the army. I worked for the government. I worked for the state government too. I just don't buy conspiracies very well. <laughs> I, I just, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of talking around the water cooler in both the service and the state government. So conspiracies would be tough. It was a big end in the corner that appeared to breathe. And, oh, I do remember that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I do remember that. Yeah, I must have started. So I got into the Army in 93, uh, and I didn't. I had a word processor. And a friend I was in graduate school, and a friend of mine, uh, Drew Halevi, uh, he, once we started hanging out, he came over the house and looked at my, <laughs> my fat little, little word processor and put me in a car, and we went down to, uh, I don't know, I don't know what it was. And, um, we had, I was set up on Windows 3.1, is that right? Windows 3.1, within about four hours, uh, he had me, he had me hooked up on AOL. And the interesting thing about Drew, Drew was a great guy. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but, uh, fantastic guy. A very good historian, but, uh, great teacher. He... <laughs> told me that uh, uh, you can't use don't use Windows. It wasn't that I can't. It wasn't Windows 3.1. I'm sorry. That would have been that time frame. He said you can't use Windows. Windows. Uh, what did he say? I can't remember what it was, but Windows is essentially for idiots. Uh, and he taught me DOS. He gave me the the, the you know the book of all the commands. And within and I didn't know any different. I didn't know anything about Windows and the pictures and all of that crap. Uh, so he had me doing DOS, so to open up Word Perfect is what I used, and to get to AOL, uh, I could do all kinds of stuff in DOS in those days. I had all those commands memorized. And my God, did the computer fly like madness? I mean, it was just fast on everything. But uh, at some point, he switched to 3.1 and got me to switch to 3.1. Is that, is that the one? Was that the one that came out before 95 or X, did XP? Windows XP. I can't. But uh, can't be a good whiteboard. But I know their days started to be numbered when people started to regularly take a photo of the whiteboard with their phone at the end of a week. Uh oh. I think I missed something. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I never used Tor. Uh, I'm not one of the people for group. Yeah, it was a. Uh, yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah, that's the sad thing, Barry. Well, you know, he was right. What he told me was, and it was <laughs> Drew could be very graphic in his description, but he said if you use Windows, you're never going to learn to use the computer properly, and you're just going to be if someone like with a coloring book, you know, moving <laughs> pictures around or whatever. And he, in a way, he was right because when I went to Windows and I never went back to DOS, now, <laughs> now I can't do anything. <laughs> So I can't even figure out the InDesign that I've been working on for years at, at 1 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, yeah, it, in some ways, Drew was, uh, you know, ahead of his time. But um, <laughs> it was very interesting. Very interesting. So, Flu, I remember uh, dial-up. I'm sure you guys, too, that, you know, whatever noise it made. <sighs> Would, yeah, you know, I'm not either. I mean, I am, too, because... Shirley Linux was around back then, and he did a lot of his own program. We played the living crap on a Doom too. He loved that. Uh, in fact, he he, I don't know what he did. But he got rid of his Doom two and got something else, and it was on five floppies. But he threw those in the back of my truck. I didn't know what they were, and in the truck forever, 
I remember we were at Barnes and Noble when he threw the, the floppies out of the mall, when he threw the floppies into the back of the truck, and uh, they, they stayed in that truck for weeks. Until later, I asked him, I said, what is this thing doing to? What did you throw in our truck? And he said, just load it into your computer. So I loaded it and played Doom 2 through DOS, and, um, and it was an awesome game. But he went in, and he started making his own scenarios. I don't know how he did that. So he would do where you started with the, the BFT, and just there was room after room of demons and whatnot. So he, I mean, he was pretty clever. I'm not sure why. I'm not, I don't know why he never got me to, to do Linux. I kind of wish he did. You know, my wife, she's very computer savvy, and she, she did the Linux stuff uh, for the longest time. I want to say that when she started her practice, she, she had everything on Linux, but I can't remember that. Um, and it seems like if you really want to be, you know, uh, as deep into computers, Linux is the way to go because you're doing all the stuff. So. That was basic back in the day. Now, I will say this, and I'm sure one of you guys can tell me what I'm talking about. So, the time is going to be, I was in Germany, uh, which would have been in the 8th, ninth, and 10th grade. So it wasn't 8th grade, it's going to be ninth or 10th grade. So this is going to be, what, 1980, 1979, or 1980, somewhere around that time. And I took a computer class. Uh, I don't remember anything about it. I just don't know what we were doing it. But we, I do remember we had to write programs, and I remember the machine um, that would run it. If we would, I don't remember what we would do with the pro how or anything, but it was like this really noisy that would print stuff off on rolls of paper. What am I talking about? What? <laughs> Does anyone know what the hell I'm talking about? Because that was in the computer class, and obviously in the late 70s, early 80s, it's before, you know, the desktop and all that crap. I was this many years old, and I'm getting older. <laughs> yeah, I was a little older, uh, but I do remember that I don't know what kind of machine I was on punch cards. Maybe it was, the machine would have been like, of course now my memory is not great. Dot matrix, that sounds... Man, that's got to be it. Dot matrix. That sounds very, very familiar. But I do. I don't know. I don't know how I wrote a program or what I did, or what it was, uh, or where we put it. I didn't pay much attention. Man, no, that's not. Maybe that's it. Well, my it kills my speaker when I'm online. That man, that doesn't look like it. It looks like it, it could be. And like my my head, my my memory is horrific. But it seemed to be a large typewriter-esque thing with a spool of paper. This is a little bit more, this, this dot matrix here from Microline is a little bit more up to date. I'm going to have to poke around and see. I'll, I'll poke around and see if I can't find what the, what the bloody heck I'm talking about. But uh, that paper may have been green and white. I think you're right. I think you're right. Man, it's been Adam's night. That was a long time ago. <laughs> Learn AutoCAD when it was still a dog's program like I did when I was architectural in 1990. Yeah. Teletype, maybe teletype. It was something. I remember too, it was like, um, that's it. I think that's it, dude. Maybe. Yeah. Ah, it won't, it won't make any noise. I think that's it. I think it's a teletype. Uh, maybe. That, that's funny. That was very, very crazy to me. Well, the, the paper, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to I'm gonna have to research. Teletype, and what's this other thing, a daisy wheel? That's funny. Man, a long time ago. It's funny how far we've gone. No, it's not a daisy wheel. That looks a little bit advanced for what? Man, I wonder, you know, I might dig out. i got to go up to the farm where all my yearbooks are and whatnot. I may dig out my yearbooks from those long ago days and see, well, that could have been, that looks a little older, just click your link there. I, I, I wonder if my yearbook might have a computer, you know, a picture from a computer class or whatever, I don't know, it had to have been something unique, right, 1980, 1979, uh, that's fine. I do, I do have to say I love that, I heard it somewhere in some movie, I do love that noise that it makes, that chaka 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 whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, for today, <laughs> long time gone is what that was. Uh, 
It reminds me of that John Wayne movie. Uh, is it, it's not Ruth Cogburn, one of them, where his son's on a motorcycle and his, and uh, the marshals all have the Rangers all have cars. And John Wayne's <laughs> all confused. Uh, it it might I I really think a teletype is what I think Epi's not I think a teletype is what it is. Uh, it's some type of teletype. I'm looking at it now. I remember it was kind of oh we programmed something in, but I don't I cannot remember how I did that. Uh, and I and I honestly I probably was not I was probably not paying a lot of attention. <laughs> I was in school and you know, I, I was that kid who in, in my pants I was having a cheat sheet stuck in his pants. I was <laughs> everything I could to, to kind of weasel my way through through high school. I, I just wanted an out. That was my that was my big thing. That changed when I got to college. I really enjoyed this book. I really enjoyed, enjoyed learning it. My granddad used to do etching with acid with a glass pen on a copper plate. Oh, that's that's <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a little bit uh, a low tech for me there. That's what we need to do, Peter. We need to get ourselves out of the old Gutenberg press type thing and make it make our books like they did back in the eighteen eighties. I know that's not a Gutenberg press, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Might take us a little bit longer than using into that. I will say this, laying out a book, when I watch any kind of western and I'm watching like the scenes in the news room when I was watching uh, what is that Western TV show? Deadpool. Not Deadpool. Deadwood. And there's a scene where they're in with the news talking, you know, with that news. And he's sitting, he's sitting in the print. Oh, my good Lord. <laughs> it take forever to do that. You had to do it daily on that? Good God. <clears throat> ah, printing. That's the way it is. McClintlock. There you go. Yeah, that's a good one. That's where he's hunting his grandson, right? That's got the... Um, um, Probably the most famous John Wayne line. Well, one of the most famous is famous. Is one of the most famous. What um, and he says, uh, I don't. If it's your fault, if it's your fault, my fault, nobody's fault at all. I'm going to blow your head off. Absolutely love. I absolutely love John Wayne movies. <laughs> I was just watching Hondo the other day. Uh, I absolutely love John Wayne on screen. He's just got this this saunter about him. It's just cool. It's just very cool. All right. So before we wander off onto a movie, a movie discussion, as, as we did last, I think last AMA was mostly talking about horror movies. Um, speaking of which, do watch The Hunt. It's it's nothing like it was billed. It's not a big political thing. It's not left versus right. Uh, it really just has a simple message at the end, which is cool. But it is violent, uh, and one of the main characters is from Arkansas. So <laughs> enjoy that about it. But. Um, so, yeah, if you have any questions about Troll or Kickstarter or anything else that we're doing, give us a shout. We have we launched today at Kickstarter. Uh, we are bringing the Monsters and Treasures of Air to the 5th edition universe. Uh, here it is, of course, for Capitals and Crusade, 170-odd monsters. Uh, and this is going to be the third in a, a group of uh, boxes. We've done the first two, first two already, a third in a group of boxes for 5th uh, edition. Um, and in Capitals and Crusades news, we are... Looking ever ever towards the horizon with uh, uh, a new Planescapes book, and we're approaching. I want to take a minute to talk about the Planescapes because uh, first, is Gods and Monsters. So it's going to kick off with Gods and Monsters, which I'm hoping is done in the next few, four, three or four weeks, kind of depending on what other uh, stuff comes in. But uh, so we, Jim Ward did a fantastic job with Gods and Monsters, but the, we're going to retool almost the entire book. Uh, we're going to keep some of his gods and stuff, but um, the purpose behind it is really how to get, uh, how to play both from the player's perspective and the CK's perspective, how to play uh, gods at the table, how to bring them to the table a little bit more uh, manageable so that it's not either through the roof or it's not something that is unrealistic because it's just, you know, kicking the crap out of gods all the time. Um, but, uh, so Gods and Monsters is going to kick this thing off, and a, a, a good chunk of it is going to be this kind of approach to how to run deities at the table, uh, and what to do with them, powers that they have, and then the, I finished the Avatar section not long ago, and then the Avatars to play with them, so that you can play them. Oh, I go again, shit! And so that I can play, so you can play them at low level and medium level, and high level with the gods kind of interacting. Yeah, and one of the things that I discussed uh, quite a bit was the idea is that some of these gods have subconscious reactions. So there may be an avatar that appears to a second level adventure and party god isn't even aware of. So if they slay that avatar, it doesn't really matter. The god's not going to be upset. He doesn't know what happened. 
it was just the subconscious part of him that manifested in this, uh, you know, in this arena when he was character card. So uh, it's things like that that we're approaching and approaching it a little differently, and we're making pantheons for all of the demon humans and pantheons for the monsters. So you just have a plethora of information here. And once this is done, uh, that's going to shoehorn right into the Planescape books. And I'm going to do two things with this. Uh, I've already started in on it. Um, I'm going to take the area of mythology and weave it into the traditional Dungeons and Dragons mythology that you saw in the, the Planescape book, mainly the Planescape book, Gahana and, uh, you know, Elysium and etc. Et et I'm going to weave it all together, together and try to make it a really playable format uh, so that everybody can. Uh, either whether you're using air or not, you can enjoy the fruits of that, you know, that whole uh, region and, and approach that we have to it simultaneously as staying in a very comfortable, you know, arena where you're, you're having fun with it. And we're going to try to make it very playable. One of the hard things about using planes is there's no, you know, ready-made monster lists and treasure lists and how to do this and how to do that and how would there be a, uh, you know, dungeons and how you would find this and how would you cross the sea of fire. So we're going to try to cover that type of stuff. Uh, that will all hinge heavily on uh, the Brian Young's uh, mythology series that he's working on. So we'll borrow stuff from Brian's uh, already published material and use that in the Planescape book to make sure that everything kind of lines up. So, for instance, we've just done the Egypt book. And in the Egypt book, it describes the path of the dead, uh, and this will be described again in the Planescape book, and you'll be able to book, and you'll be able to know how to physically get from one spot to the other in in the Egyptian emerald. So, uh, it really, it's what I really, really want to be working on right now. All the other this other stuff, I need <laughs> need to wrap it up so I can dive into it. So lots of stuff coming forward with the, with the Planescape. With many RPGs adding more exotic races to the list when compared to the Standard fantasy races, how would you keep a balance in ability? Example, a centaur is a full horse and wouldn't have a, a size increase compared to the general human race. Yeah, I'm not a huge I'm not a huge fan of allowing so many playable races. Um, I, I know it's, I know a lot of game systems do it, a lot of CKs and, and GMs allow it or you you know, whatever's out there. But um, balance and that's part of part of it is the balance is what you're talking about because uh, they have natural abilities that cap out quickly, so you're going to have to definitely weave them into a class. But then once you've done that, you're going to have they're going to have this other stuff that comes to the table. So uh, it's really it's sort of like the elf. You know, the elf is a little bit powerful because they've got all of these abilities. Dwarf has a few, but they're kind of benign. Knowing stonework or what have you, pretty benign. It might help you from you know, having rock, rocks fall on your head, but it's not like this elf who can move silently and hide in shadows and hear noises and find secret doors. Um, so, uh, I mean, your, your unbalanced one is already at the table and that's the elf. But to, to do that, I, I think if you were to allow... Um, okay, what did you say? I have, some, I have seen some games that limit via class level to boost the other players with more magic items. The limit of being class level is actually very good. That's what AD&D used to do. I can't remember any of the limitations at this point, but uh, remember that Halfling can only be like sixth level as a, as a thief or something? I can't remember. Whatever it was. So limiting a level spread is probably going to be your best approach to that, I would say. Because uh, if you do the magic item thing, then you, you might unbalance it, and they might lose those magic items, and it kind of knocks it back and forth. Uh, I guess my first comment would be I don't worry about balance too much, generally speaking, but you have to when it comes to things like damage and you know, stuff like that. So uh, it's, it's a tough, that's a tough thing to, to figure out because of, and just the natural abilities that come with these other, these other species. Uh, how, how's it going, Willie? <laughs> Ghostly apparition of Steve. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got the the thing Chuck's been wanting me to get. It kills it has killed killed the glare in my glasses, but it's a little bit warm and it needs to go back about a foot. So <laughs> or so. Which doesn't fit with this crazy setup I've got going on here, which means I'm gonna have to figure something out that to move that chair. No one needs that chair. Oh Lord. 
Yeah. <laughs> a centaur probably could not climb ladders. <laughs> that, would be, that would be a very difficult thing to do. And this is mainly pointing directly at 5e. There are elephant and monster races that are at the, their base, very unbalanced compared to the standard core race. Yes, yeah, see, and that's, I just, I've never liked it. I didn't like the Minotaur. I really don't care. I, I kind of believe, from a gamer's perspective, I mean, you're in a fantasy environment, right? Obviously, so we want to believe in fantastic. But from our perspective, the fantastic is already there. We're casting spells, we're healing people, you know, wielding magic weapons, chopping off heads with the Vorpal Blade and what have you, and all that business. So the fantastic is already there. Um, to add more fantastic to it just waters it down, in, in my opinion. So having all of these species as, as new classes are a, a playable. Just it just clouds the issue, and I don't think it's necessary. I think it's uh, I don't I don't know what the word is. It's just and I know it's been going on forever. It started with Dragonlance, right? Didn't they? There was. Could you play the the dragon creatures? I can't remember. But even like in in the world of air, I, I created the Karnar Rook, and I don't want it to be a playable class. I, I may have made rules at some point for the Karnar Rook to be a playable class. I think it's that thing, maybe. Uh, but I, I did so. If I did, I did it reluctantly because it's a monster. The Karen Rook is a type of assassin, and it's attached to Unklar, the Horned God, and it should not be. Yeah, I don't know. Let me I, I put that somewhere. Uh, but it shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be at the table. That, that it's a monster. Um, Draconius, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were monsters. Okay, I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember if you could play one or not. I was wanting to say that. Maybe it's maybe it's Sons of the Dragon. It's Sons of the Dragon third edition, right? You could play the Half Dragon. Is that where that came in? And I, I think that was three O. Uh, and I ran into that when we were doing the original Gasmore book because there's a Half Dragon. Which come on, man, a dragon and and a dude. It's like it's like Shrek. I love those movies, Shrek. The first one was fantastic, but. And I know it's a cartoon, and you shouldn't worry about suspension disbelief because it's a cartoon with the dragon boy. You know, but, man, it's a donkey and a dragon. How, how does that happen? <laughs> I don't even want to envision it. And while, <laughs> and while I was sitting there watching it with my kids a gazillion years ago, I was like, what? How did that happen? <laughs> Come on, man. It's a donkey. Uh, so I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the whole cross-pollinating and species and whatnot. And the dragonborn is certainly that very carefully. <laughs> you know, the dragon. I know, it's crazy. Uh, it, the dragonborn, and then um, there's, uh, there's lots of them. And obviously, 42, you already mentioned there's quite a few of them. And they have shrunk the right idea to fit in the, into a, a medium humanoid world. Yeah, I think there's a huge, I don't know, there's quite a discussion going on about drow and orcs and stuff, but they're, they're different species, right? I mean, they're not different races, but they're different species. Uh, entirely, and they should remain so, and whatever, I mean, the monster, and that's one reason I think that you just get into this whole, I don't know, you just water it down, I mean, but when you, it's sort of like, you know, playing Monopoly, and everybody gets to start with 12 houses, well, I've had fun, I won't play checkers, but I get twice as many features, ah, come on, stop, <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, the Dragonborn kind of started that, um, I think, probably. And again, I get it. I mean, I get that people really want to play something different and cool, and I get all of these extra extra things, but I'm not into that. I, I think that uh, you should be playing with Conan or the Legolas or Gimli or, you know, whoever and whatever, uh, and you take that that character concept and make that extraordinary, either through and with your GM, CK, DM, or on your own. Do it on your own. You don't need any, you know, coaching. Steve likes the traditional fantasy. Some of us like our ridiculous stuff. <laughs> yeah, you are definitely a huge fan of anime, without a doubt. And I can get into a little bit of it. I, ha I haven't enjoyed anime as much as uh, others have. Which is odd, because I love Star Wars. Though I don't know if that's technically anime. But at least something for me and you to really see. Yeah, Moondog, that's, I mean, that's a good point. It's, and once everything's in class. And then once, and, and then once you allow the Minotaur to be a playable class, which is kind of, it sounds really cool, and I get that, but you're going to have to change the entire world setting to adjust to that. I mean, allowing a bullhead creature to come into your 
into your tavern is different than allowing a dwarf to come into your tavern or an elf or, or whatever, or human, if you've got a dwarf in the tavern or whatever. Star Blazer is very interesting. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I love Star Blazer. So there's my anime for that. There's <laughs> my favorite anime. So to have the Minotaur come in, I mean, it's a whole, and, and obviously you don't want to overthink it, but I overthink it, and so does my original dungeon master, Davis, when I fight AD&D with Davis, overthinks it. So when the Minotaur comes in, it's a herbivore? Is a Minotaur an herbivore, right? So they're going to eat grass? I mean, no? I have no idea what Minotaurs eat. So there's this whole mess that just comes with it, and it's, I, what do you think, sorry, what are these? I don't know. No cow has four stomachs in. I don't know. Anyway, so you can easily kind of begin to extrapolate problems out from this. Um, you know, I like I like start I like speed racer too. Snails <laughs> is a playable class. <laughs> Wait, what? You can actually play snails? Please don't tell me that you can play snails. Classically, the miniature eats people. Okay, there you go. That would work, and at least it can come into the tavern and eat whatever is in the tavern. Uh, so that <laughs> that's good. Thanks, Ben Adam. I guess that's true, because he's in the, the Minotaur's in the, the, the creek? Was it creek? I can't, I mean, my creek mythology is horrible, horrible at it. So I can pull. You need a wretched hive of villainy for some of those races to intermingle. <laughs> yes, wait a minute, but I'm still kind of stuck on a snail thing. You can play a snail somewhere? Why in the, why in the name of, I got this cardinal. You know, there it is. I got this cardinal out here. You know, I feed the birds all the time. I got this cardinal with his wings broken. I saw him in the early, early spring. Not broke. Just it won't fold in. It just it can't fly but 12 feet at a, at a span. But he's the meanest bird I have ever seen. That, he's just out there right now fighting a dove. That bird fights everybody. And he's tiny. I don't know why. I don't know why he survived this long. Crete and the king and the king minus hence the name Minotaur. There you go. See it slowly. <laughs> slowly. Bits and pieces are floating around in the, the wasteland of my mind. Robotech. I haven't seen that. Uh, my son's a huge fan of anime, and Peter absolutely loves anime. Uh, and my daughter's watching Avatar. I think they just re-released that. Is Avatar technically anime? I guess I don't really know what anime is. Uh, manga is the printed version, right? And anime is the cartoon version. Came out in the 80s. Speed Racer. And that crazy car with those saws that came out and cut trees down. Mm. Macro plus still the best. So Moondog, you didn't answer me, or did you? Did I miss it? Is there? Can you play a snail? <laughs> I can't. My brain can't quite. Uh, Okay, nothing came up. So I'm gonna snail one. What? It's just snail. Does the snail even have a brain? Sort of online and log horizon for the greatest ZK. I cannot say that word. Damn it! Pulling to another world. Anyways, ever. What was was that spelled? Damn it! All right, Moondog. You still haven't answered my question. If you can play a snail, I'm afraid that you can, and I don't want to know it. Uh, Macros Plus. I am desperately trying not to listen to anything that suggests that anyone can play a snail. <laughs> I'm with you, Commander. <laughs> I'm looking at something online. I'm not sure what I'm looking at, but uh, I mean, come on. What are you going to do with this now? What? What? Well, okay, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Whatever type of game. I'm a huge fan of playing the game you want to play. So. <laughs> You can TPK a sale party with a salt shaker. There you go. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I don't know, whatever. Whatever gets you go. If you want to play a snail, that's awesome, I suppose. Yeah, play a snail. <laughs> I'm just more for the slightly more traditional approach to hero or fantasy role play. Yeah. Uh, and I like the classes to be kind of standard. Uh, and then and the player to take that and blossom, you know, to go with it, to create uh, backstories and uh, personalities and quirks and traits and all of these things that go with them as you go forward. And, uh, you know, that's where the fantastic comes from. That's your imagination. Uh, taking something that... I don't, you know, don't move very fast. I'm not... <laughs> I don't 
they can fly. I don't know. There's not much a snail could do. I guess if it was if it was present, uh, it's got a couple antennas. I don't know. For me, if as a DM, blah blah blah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, We need an amalgam of that. You you allow a monster or exotic race, and then it is up to you to keep the balance by presenting each play with the scenes that highlighted the character's abilities. With level stunning, stunting, it's really needed for pure mechanics to use. Yeah, I think, honestly, 42, you've got it there. I mean, the level stunting is the way to do it. It's, the Minotaur is going to show up at the field with, obviously, a godlike strength of 22 or whatever, 21, so they're going to have an advantage already. Um, so uh, if, you're going to, if you're going to do it, definitely do it then. And then, uh, you know, it was mentioned kind of jokingly, but also play it up realistically so if they're playing a centaur the idea that they can go into a dungeon they can't go into certain parts of that dungeon because they can't go up and down not with any uh, they just can't they can't go up a, a ladder that's 10 feet into a hatch that's three by three feet they're just not going to fit so i think that if you play that up that in and of itself will be a limitation and also if you play up things like um they're not going to, people at a, at, at a town aren't going to let send centaurs into the town for whatever reason. I mean, you can do a lot of things to put that into a really dangerous zone, which you don't want to get into. You really do not want to, um, not to step on a powder keg of today's world, but you don't want to restrict anyone playing at your table because of uh, their species, uh, simply because they're not going to have fun. If you don't want them to play the species in the first place, don't let them play that. Uh, but if you start doing all of this kind of weird shit, stop them. But, you can certainly do it realistically, you know, what they can hold and what they couldn't. Uh, a Minotaur is going to be huge, so 90% of the magic that comes out, of 90% of the weapons, armor, and stuff, magic, they're not going to be able to use because their hands are too big or their chest is too big or what have you. Uh, centaurs, the same goes. They can't wear the magic chain mail. It doesn't fit. Um, so I, I think you can do it. And like you said, 42 is a great idea. Balance it with the level stuff, but also balance it with realism. Uh, make it so that the characters... Suffer from, and now they're going to gain too, because if you're a centaur, you can run really fast and, you know, do this, that, and the other uh, for like a half or a cent and whatnot. So there's, so there's going to be advantages to come with it, but definitely, uh, definitely keep the uh, the realism about their, their, actually what they are and where they can go and how they can do them. Magnificent Imagine Cats on a Snow Snowstorm. <laughs> there you go. Sci fi is something else. I'm surprised that ODD had any race other than human. Uh, yeah, and it actually did it kind of cool, didn't it? I mean, you had the um, the dwarf was a class, right? And the elf was a class, is that right? Uh, so you started with these abilities, and there you went. And maybe that's another way to do it, um, 42. Go back to the roots of the game. If they're going to play a centaur, the centaur is the class, right? So they, the centaur has X. Maybe this is this is the best way to do it. And the centaur, the centaur has X, Y, and Z abilities, and that's the class. They don't. They aren't fighters. They aren't rangers or clerics or wizards. This is what you are. You're a centaur, and this is what you've got. So I think that there we we kind of worked out what I think is a really good solution. Um, it, it it's the roots of the game. I mean, uh, we did that in the player's guide to air. That's what we made each of the classes. Uh, and I think we pulled it out real quick. But I'll open up this, one of these idiots. Um, so the gnome, I've got the gnome here. So the gnome abilities are nature lore, nature lore, poisons, assume elemental form, and they can cast limited spells. Uh, the halfling has animal mim mimicry, climb, combat, conceal, a few other abilities, uh, but no spell using ability. So, yeah, I think that's probably, I think that's a, a good way to do it. Take, take your minotaur, your centaur, uh, your snail, whatever it is, and make that the actual class. They, they don't get to play the wizard. They don't get to play the other stuff. And that balances it almost immediately. You're going to have to give them more than probably than what's in the monster book. There's going to be chances on not that many. I think. I haven't looked at the edition close enough. The fifth edition monsters may have lots of abilities. I'm not aware. But, uh, yeah, I like that. I don't know how we got there, but I like that we got there. <laughs> See, we all kind of came together. We got there in, in one way or the other. Yeah, I did too. I, I always did, Peter. I, I'm saying I'm right with you. I thought it was really cool. I loved playing a dwarf back in a uh, hundred years ago. Um, they were they were very cool. Very cool. Oh ah, well, Lord, it's already five o'clock. Uh, I want to thank everybody for showing up for asking me anything today. And this is a great conversation uh, about uh, 
uh, 42 has led the, the charge today with the, the racial classes. I don't know that we can we should call it that. I don't know what to call it, but it's just species <laughs> that this is it. This is what you're playing. Uh, but uh, very cool. And this is why I like actually really like this 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 particular stream. I like the geometric trade on those. That's that's great. But this is kind of us working through issues that we always face, right, at the table, that we're always kind of, what do we do with this stuff? How do we handle this stuff? What's a good idea? And collectively, it's like a it's like a GM's council or a DM's council or a CK's council or whatever of all the movies. These <laughs> three knuckleheads would come up with this. Folk classes, they call it racist, racist class. There you go. I don't know. But isn't it a species? I don't know. It's too much tech. Too many technical terms. <laughs> they just way overthink a lot of this stuff. <laughs> I think there's a, you know, a problem with the many many parts of the, <laughs> the entire planet that we way over that thing. In the South, you don't overthink things because it's so damn hot that you just want to sit there and sweat. <laughs> try, or try not to sweat if you possibly can. Race is scientifically correct. All right, well, there you go. All right, well, <laughs> on that, <laughs> that note... And we will we will leave it. Thank you all for showing up uh, for asking me anything, and uh, we'll be back again next Tuesday. I hopefully will have a slightly better arrangement going on, or hopefully by Thursday, game tricks and trade at four o'clock, I believe. Uh, there may be a hiccup this week, but uh, we'll do game tricks and trade later this week. And uh, got manager painting tomorrow. They change the title. I can't remember what it is. And Chuck should be back on Saturday. And sometime, maybe this week, definitely next week. I'm going to set up an online game uh, to do on the Discord channel, and we'll, we'll stream it here on Twitch just a couple hours. Uh, so thank you. Thanks, uh, M5, everybody. Thanks, Willie. Uh, ben Adams, uh, 42, everybody. Thanks for showing up and uh, sitting with us today. I'm going to go I'm going to go find some grub now before I fall asleep. By the way, the email said this was trick to the trade. Nah, we're idiots. <laughs> we we just troll Lord pretty well. <laughs> it's not just constant chaos. Um, yeah, no, this is asking me anything. GM Tricks of the Trade should be on Thursday. Might we might have to move it up. I, I gotta see. We got I got weird stuff going on this weekend. So, all right, everybody, thanks for showing up. Uh, thanks, Mike Forty Two. We will talk to you later. All right, take it easy, everybody. <laughs>